What's shaking, everybody? My name is Luke Dancy, and I'm sitting right next to, well, I wish I was, the one and only Mr. Farrell Dillon. How we doing, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. All right, all right. It's good to see you, my friend. I know that uh, I saw you a couple years back here in Las Vegas, and that's something we're going to talk about, is that uh, Farrell was on the Las Vegas trip at Bally's, uh, one of the headliners in the Masters of Illusion show. Um, we're going to talk about that, talk about your work on cruise ships, um and tv appearances and, and all that fun stuff so first of all how are you my friend how you doing over there during this quarantine time i'm doing really good i got my kids upstairs they're stomping around so if you guys hear some stomping <laughs> that's my kids just walking around upstairs i'm down in our uh our little basement uh like i, I put up a little movie theater in our basement because i can't take the kids to the movies so i made uh, i used some of my uh show production equipment to make a movie theater in our house so that uh, they can watch movies. Um, we uh, we got the Trolls movie and we the new one, and we put it on the screen in our basement. Hell yeah, man. Got to make the best of these times. And uh, it must be tough for you, though, because normally you're on the road. You're performing a lot. That's what you do. Farrell is a full-time professional magician. That's how he makes his living. Um, and now you're, uh, you know, now you're doing the thing at home sticking around with the family and you know trying to stay busy so why don't we talk about what it is that you normally do um <laughs> you know normally the stuff that you're out there making a living doing um i've got some of that footage too to show people so yeah tell people about feral dylan all right so well normally i'm uh traveling around doing gigs uh i do shows all over the world um i work on ships quite a bit i do college shows corporate shows all that kind of stuff um, I also uh, work in the Masters of Illusion show. They have a touring theater show that they do. Hey, Lewis, I'm going to show some of your art later. Uh, Lewis is an artist from uh, Lima, Peru. He makes amazing uh, art and stuff. He did this for me. Cool. Um, I have a bunch of other stuff that he's done for me. He's, he's amazing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I've been to, like, 50 countries. Um I do like a comedy magic show and uh, yeah, I mean, basically right now I'd be probably on the road somewhere. I uh, stay home, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks and then I'll go out for two, three weeks and then I'll come home and go back and forth. But you know what? Like, honestly, this time at home has been pretty awesome. I've been getting to do things that I never, ever get to do, like work on my yard and uh, fix up stuff in my house. So it rules. It's kind of actually a really, I'm really having fun with it so that's awesome yeah i mean i got to know you pretty well when you were out here in las vegas for the masters of illusions show over at bally's um that was really cool to see you in action you know i've seen you on tv and stuff like that but to see you actually in action doing your act you know feral more of a comedy magician uh and when he does his stuff um you definitely see why he's called that because you bring the uh you bring the laughs along with some really really tight magic so yeah good stuff and we can see some of that here uh with you on the uh it's like Masters of Illusion yeah, here. Yeah, I kind of describe a few of the things. Like I do a, a 51 cards to pocket routine. Um, basically, it's uh, the the Williamson 51 cards to pocket, the homing card thing. Uh, I enjoy that trick. It's a really great trick. Um, it has a it has a good kicker ending. So that's like one of my favorite. That's like my go to close up trick, honestly. Um, and then I do uh, a billiard ball routine. Uh, I do some illusions and stuff. Uh, I do my own um, little theater, like touring little theater show sometimes. So um, I have a few illusions. Uh, I, so I did card and mouth for a long time. Um, that was one of my like staple things where uh, I'd have a guy um, hit a card out of my mouth with a stick uh, or hit the cards out of my It was like uh, I basically took the idea, hey, Kozak, what's up, man? Uh I, I, there's this old trick where you'd have people like hold cards between their fingers and then they'd smack them out. And the one left in their hand was like the card that they picked. It's an old, uh, like kids trick. And then, um, I thought how funny it would be to do like card and mouth and have the same kind of idea where they smack it with a stick. And, uh, I make fun of like, as they, as they try to hit it, they normally just tap on it and I make fun of them. Um, and then, uh, Eventually, they hit the cards out, and then the one in folded in my mouth is their card. It's just like my little take on that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah I do man. a multiply chair routine, all kinds of stuff. His uh, And Farrell's manipulation stuff is just 
awesome too. He does, as you saw a little uh, clip there um, during the promo reel there, billiard ball manipulation, also thimble magic, which it's funny. The, the way that he does it makes it so entertaining. It can compete with like any like major illusion on a stage. It's kind of crazy how you can do thimbles and just take the house down, like bring them down. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's really weird about that is a lot of people think that it's um, a big deal that a lot of the audience can't really see them. Mm. Um, but it's very strange. If you light it correctly, more people can see it. And then along with that, uh, if you describe what's happening on stage, it really doesn't matter in the long run if they can see this like one minute trick. So, um, yeah, like, and then as my show goes on, um, it becomes more and more apparent that it doesn't matter if they really see all of it. So, <laughs> Well, uh, I want to let the guys know, too, along the way, feel free to uh, drop your questions in the comments. Uh, I already see some coming in. If you want to ask Farrell anything about, you know, cruise ships, we'll get into, you know, that. he He's on cruise ships a lot. Um, he's also on different stages all over the world, including Las Vegas, and stages on TV, TV audiences, too. So if you want to know anything about that. Um, also, just so that you guys know, our live viewers, you have a chance to win some free stuff, too. You know, I know you're stuck at home. So if you want to win a free download of your choice from the Etsy Table series, just drop a like and comment on this video, and we'll pick two winners live today during the chat. We'll announce them at the end, um, one for Facebook and one for YouTube. Um, so we want to hook you guys up with something while you're kind of stuck at home. So, uh, yeah. So our first question actually comes from Mark. Uh, Mark says, uh, how did you get into magic and who inspired you? Also, where was the most awesome place you ever performed? So let's back it up to how you got started, and then we'll get into more of those right. deeper so, questions. Uh uh, the way I started, like I got into magic, um, I went and I went to Lake Tahoe, Nevada, or, uh, I guess like it's on the border of California, Nevada. It's a big lake, um, in, uh, in California slash Nevada. And, uh, it's the second deepest lake in North America. It's beautiful up there. And, uh, I saw Tony Clark do a show at a little casino that he would perform and he performed there for like a decade. And my family would go up there for vacations and stuff. And uh, I saw him do a show and I just got inspired by him. So, hey, Mago George. Love you, buddy. Um, so that's how I got inspired to do magic. I mean, he did like the doves and big illusions and he was awesome. So uh, that's one of the things. And then uh, the other question was... What? Craziest place there? or coolest place you've ever performed, I believe. Man, there's there's a that's a lot to pick from. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite places uh, that I've performed at, just by sheer uh, like love the place, was uh, Lima, Peru. Um, cool. There's some really cool stuff in that city, uh, and like the magicians there are awesome. Uh, Mago George is on here right now. Luis Zavaleta is on here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both from Lima. Um, they're great dudes and also um i loved it there there there's this place in there called uh the mercado de las brujas which is like a, a witch's market and uh my wife and i and uh, a couple other of my friends went there with jeff mcbride and uh it's like a it's like a voodoo market you can buy all kinds of crazy stuff and as we were walking down the street i smelled this like horrible smell and i looked over and this like python with the head cut off and the head was sticking out of a bowl right oh. and then they had it they had it splayed all the way down the middle and like opened up and then people were coming up and buying pieces of this python and eating it raw and i was like whoa this is crazy town and we go inside the booths and there was like booths for uh, herbs and all this like weird voodoo stuff. And then there were these other booths where you could buy Santeria shit like, oh, sorry, uh, oh, Santeria stuff, <laughs> which is like um, this. Uh, they, they used to basically take uh, um, Catholic images and uh, assign them to satanic videos like our satanic uh symbols right say so, like so they would assign them to so that people wouldn't come in and see their uh satanic stuff and and kill them or whatever so um yeah that's like and uh 
Jeff McBride was like, uh, and there was like human, te- there was like a dagger made out of human teeth and like all this crazy stuff. Sounds like Indiana Jones, and this, dude. Like the freaking Temple of Doom. There's, so this woman was walking by me <laughs> and uh, she bumped into me and she dropped this bottle of yellow liquid and I picked it up for her and I go, oh, here you go. And this bottle was warm. And I go, here's this bottle. And she goes, oh, thank you. Thank you. And then like she starts walking away and I go, oh, oh, no. I had like just picked up a bottle of pee from who knows what. And like, oh my God. You know, they were the boots where you could get like a, like buy frogs and they would throw them in a smoothie, like live frogs in a smoothie and people would drink those. I mean, just like stuff you, you I've never seen before in my life. And uh, this, um, <laughs> so we're over there and Jeff McBride's like, I got to leave. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're like, you're like the man with this. He's like, this is the scariest place I've ever been. Wow. And I was like, what's those it's like, you know, play stuff. And he's like, no, I know what this stuff is. I gotta, I gotta go. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so Jeff like leaves and just leaves us there. It was the best. Wow. Wow. So. Wow. Um, a little less, uh, hopefully a little less, a uh, scary story here. Uh, <laughs> hopefully this question, uh, from Ace Cunnings. Um, what did you show the cruise ship in your interview? So let's get into some of the cruise ship stuff because that's a very popular right. market. Um, probably not the easiest to get into from what I've heard, but um, when you... Well, especially... Well, yes. Um, especially now, smart ass. So, here, here. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, you know what? I spent a lot of money having my demo reel edited. The best thing you can do is spend money on your reel. And here's why. Uh, that is what's going to get you shows and separate you from the other people in your prospective market, right? So you have to make a specific video that will appeal to that market. Um, and the way you do that is you find out, you know, you basically have to align yourself with their clientele. So you just have to think about the clientele of the cruise line or the cruise ships and align your video in that way. So make it fun, uh, make it fairly fast paced, but also you want to show that you have material because a lot of times people show stuff and it's like, you know, five minutes of card reveals. And like when, when you watch a video, like you may not realize that showing five minutes of, of card tricks um, shows that you have material, but like, it really doesn't, it really only shows that you know how to do one thing. And that's not what you're, what you want. When you make a video, you want to show that you have scale and you can do an amount of time and everything has to look different. As you start to make stuff look different in your reel, then they start to realize like, Oh, he could do this, 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 and this. And even though, you know, we could all do 45 minutes with just a deck of cards in a video that doesn't play. Yeah. And that's the truth. It looks like yeah. seconds. Yeah. Uh, um, Luis wants to know how many hours do you practice your manipulation? Because you are one of the best at it. You know, there's not a whole lot of people that do some of the stuff that you do. But, you know, how much practice do you get in to keep it kind of polished? Especially now. I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, so here's the thing. I don't, I don't want to say that I, I do like practice sessions. I know that there's a few guys out there who do straight up practice sessions. I don't do that. Um, I practice whenever I pick up a deck of cards. So whenever I pick up something, I'll play with it and practice with it. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of lost time because I'll do it while I'm watching a movie or I'll do it while I'm watching football or, you know, it just keeps my hands busy. So, um, yeah, I, I like to fidget anyways with stuff. So I don't really keep track of my hours of practice i just practice constantly cool yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do that but that's that's the way i do it uh but let's get back to the uh the ship thing real quick um so once you have a video and and here's the thing spend money on the video okay a lot of people are like oh i could do it myself but like <laughs> it'll never be as, good as somebody else who knows what they're doing and who does that for a living like just have them do it uh you know, I always tell people like, yeah, I spend 5,000 on my video or 10,000 on my video, but I'll get 150, 200,000, 300,000 worth of work before I have to do it again. You know, it depends on how much, um, uh, 
how much work I end up getting from those videos. But like, I only do my video every, uh, two years or so. So a lot of times I'll make, you know, $300,000 from a video that I spent 10,000 on. So it's worth it to spend the money and then, you know, you'll make it up later with a quality video. And what's good is when you have a great video, it sets you apart instantly from the people who don't have as good of a video. And for me, like that's my main sales tool is my video. That makes sense. Um, here's actually a question uh, along the lines of uh, what you're saying. Ray wants to know, um, how long should the reel be? So we know that you should have one, spend the money, but how long should it be? You know, too long, too short. You know, you don't want it to be either one of those. So about how long should it be? Okay, so there's a few schools of thought. Uh, one is you should have multiple videos. One should be 30 seconds, right? Because you're going to use that video to um, just like if you need to put it into something like a commercial or something like that, you're going to make a 30 second video, but you can cut that down from your regular video. You should have a video that's about three and a half to four minutes long. And that to me is like the sweet spot because it shows enough, but it also shows like it shows that you can talk on stage. You can add uh, like all kinds of different tricks and stuff in there. Um, if too short, it looks like you don't do anything. Like it doesn't, it just doesn't look like you had enough to fill out a video. Yeah. Um, I think eight minutes way too long. It used to be like you wanted an eight minute video so you could show more, but like that's way too long now. People don't have that kind of attention span. So I'd say like three and a half to four minutes is like your, your sweet spot. Sometimes four and a half if you're really like if it's a really good video. Um, but you should have a 30 second video. You should have a two minute video and you should have a three to four minute video. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it makes and sense. And you use them all totally for sense. different. Yeah. Totally makes sense. And I, and I do like what you said, you know, you got to spend money to make money too. I mean, it's just, you know, if you cheap out on the promo stuff, it doesn't exactly make you look good. So, yeah. Um, right. And like, there are other things that you could cheap, you know, like, you know, if it, like, like print material now is, is like, there's no need for it really. Yeah. Right. So like, you don't have to go to a printer and get like, uh, big, uh, like, I mean, business cards you probably need, but like, you don't need postcards. You don't need posters really. Like the main thing you need is a really good video. Um, and what's great about that is like a lot of people in, in my local area who do local shows don't even have a video. So the fact that they don't even have a video already puts me in a different class because people can actually see what they're hiring as opposed to hoping it's good. <laughs> yep. 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 Um, I'm also keeping an eye on the chat here while you're, uh, giving out all of this advice here. Uh, this is another one that, um, uh, is falling in line with the cruise ships, which is a very popular thing here. Uh, how do you get to the people who hire for cruise ships? I mean, you know, we, we're giving people information on how to present yourself, but how do you get to the people that actually make those decisions? You know? All right. So, uh, there's this really cool tool that was invented, uh, by, couple of dudes called Google. Okay. And get this. <laughs> you can just type in what you're looking for. So what you do is just go on Google, type in cruise ship talent agent or something along those lines. Um, and you'll come up with a whole bunch of different, uh, talent agencies. Uh, just go to each one of them. Look at their, uh, look at their roster, see who they have on their rosters. Look at the guys who that they're, who they're booking. Um, and that's, and that's big because, you know, if you want to align yourself with, um, those acts that they're booking, like I, I work through, uh, Don Casino Productions, which is, uh, in Hollywood, Florida. I think they're in, actually, I think they moved out Miami or whatever, but either way, uh, they move like two blocks. Um, they, uh, they have Scott Alexander on their roster, Puck, they have, um, gosh, uh, Kyle and Misty Knight. They have a uh, bunch of like really well-known magicians on their roster. And, you know, those are all people who, you know, you want to like go, oh, okay, like, you know, I can see where I would fit into this group and just send them an email and send them your promo material. Like, honestly, mine was just, here's uh here's my video. You know, if you think that you could, uh, 
use me, then I'd, that'd be great. And, you know, they, they email me back within that day. Um, and that's, that's basically all you need to do. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different um, agencies. I could name a few of them right now. There's Blackburn. There's uh, um, Fusion Talent Group. There's, uh, let's see, um, what's that? There's another one called uh, Barry, oh, Barry Ball. Uh, that's just a few of them. Those are probably some of the biggest. Uh, but Casino, John Casino Productions is the biggest one. Um, there's also uh, a buddy of mine who is also a uh, Seahawks fan, is an agent for Artist West, uh, which mostly books comics, but they're um, expanding out into variety arts as well. So they don't have a lot of magicians on their roster. I think Bill Cook is one of the only magicians on their roster at this point. Uh, maybe Matt DeSero too. Um, but other than that, like they don't really have many magicians on their roster. Um, and he's a, he's a really great agent and a really good dude. Sweet. All right. Um, as we keep going forward here, I'm, I'm checking out your questions, guys. And don't forget as well that we are doing a live giveaway today for a couple of the at the table downloads, live giveaways announce the winners here when we wrap up. So make sure you do drop a like and comment and I will grab two winners today. Um, and also if you want to make sure you never miss when we go live, just say the word live in the comments and I will hook you up. I will take care of you guys. Um, why don't we skip a little bit over to the TV side of things? Um, I know the cruise ships okay. is what you do on the regular um, along with the, you know, the tour with Masters of Illusion. But uh, the TV appearances, um, you if I'm not mistaken, um, you've been on every season of Masters of Illusion. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So why don't you talk about what it's like to not only make a TV appearance, but have to go back again and again and again trying to find something new and fresh from your act to put in there. So, yeah, I'll just let you jump in on that. <laughs> you can attest to this because you worked for Chris for a long time. Like, it, that is the hardest thing on planet Earth is to find new material. And here's the thing. Like, every time we go back and do a, a season of Masters of Illusion, they want something that has never been done on the show before. Sure. Right? So... You have to go, okay, what hasn't been done? What haven't they had on the show yet? And like, you know, whether it's like a new take on the metamorphosis, like every year there's some kind of metamorphosis, right? Like there's either suspended animation or there's uh, the regular like substitution trunk or, you know, there's some new take on it that they, they air every year because like there's only so many plots. So you have to really constantly try to think of, new material and you might even end up going back to material that you did when you were a kid doing birthday parties just because you didn't like you haven't done it on the show yet but like it's just it's so difficult to every year try to come up with like three or four brand new things that haven't ever been done on that show before especially because like you might have a take on a trick but it's not so different that uh, it doesn't resemble something that had already appeared previously on the show. And like, if, if you go, Oh, well I got this new rope trick. They go, Oh yeah, we had rope trick, a, a rope trick last year. It's like, yeah, but this is a different rope trick. Yeah, but it's still a rope trick. So like, you can't even like duplicate props that somebody used. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I got this scissor trick. Oh, we had somebody do a scissor trick last year. Right. But like, so because the 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 actual uh, not production company but the network doesn't see a difference between cut and restored rope and Professor's Nightmare, like that just they don't see a difference in it. the two things. I get it. Yeah, totally get it. Um, um, even tricks like you have to like make the card trick look so vastly different than another <laughs> card trick that like you know if you found four aces one year nobody can find four aces the next year, like even if it's totally different. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's where people like Luke and, you know, uh, Danny Garcia and, uh, Blake Voigt and those like, uh, you know, um, uh, consultant type guys really come in handy because, uh, they're constantly thinking of new stuff. And I, I, I worry more about doing shows. So like, you know, I'm not constantly creating new things like, like you guys are. Hello. Well, my sound is off. 
Oops, my there there we go. Sorry, Farrell. Um, I was I was just saying I, I'm I'm more used to being behind the scenes. We can see here you are definitely more used to being in front of the camera or in front of an audience, um, and you, you've teamed up here with Greg Gleason. Um, why don't you talk about what it's like? You know, most people, the majority of people, have not done magic on TV. They've never done an appearance like this. Um, I know we talked about the material, but why don't you talk a little bit about the experience in general? Maybe shed a little light if someone has been thinking about appearing on a show like this or any TV show, you know, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this show especially is, um, they shoot all the episodes in like five days. So there's like 13 episodes that get shot in about five days. So, you know, a lot of times people go, well, you know, they could have made that look better or they could have made this look better. Well, the magicians only typically get one chance to do the thing. So, you know, if it doesn't go perfectly the first time, like it's like, They'll try to fix it however best they can, and that's it. Like because they they're trying to get through so many guys in so little amount of time that you know you're not necessarily guaranteed to have the best thing that you could possibly do uh, on on air, and that's just the way it is. You know we don't have much control over a lot of the stuff that ends up on the TV, uh, but like ultimately it doesn't really matter for us um because what we're looking for out of the show like i'm not i'm not even sure how many people really uh like I, i'm sure that it gets pretty good ratings because i keep renewing it um uh, but you know I, i've asked people a million times like have you seen that show and you know sometimes people say yes sometimes they say no um but for us it's all about the the footage right because now i have a demo reel that even though i pay for the editing of like I have footage on there that I could not possibly afford mm -hmm. to make it myself, right? Because like the, just the footage from my demo reel would have cost me $250,000, right? But now I have over the years amassed enough footage that I couldn't possibly make it look this pro doing it myself. So, um, but again, you only get like one chance to do this stuff. So it's high pressure. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, like now I'm doing stuff on there that I've never even done before. So I'm not even sure it's totally going to work because it's not part of my working repertoire. And it's just basically put out for this TV show so that I can get more airtime on TV. Right. Um, and based on that, too, uh, you know, being on TV, Mark wanted to know, uh, who do you perform to when you're on a show like Masters of Illusion? Is it more to the camera? Or is it more to the actual audience? And that's something I really never thought about myself. So good question, Mark. Yeah. Um, so when I do, like, I'm a live performer, so I always perform to the audience. Uh, but a lot of times when we're shooting Masters of Illusion, people don't realize there's only like four or five people in the audience. Uh, because when you, uh, they have a nighttime shoot, which has a live audience of about 200, 250 people. And then... In the daytime, they have a whole bunch of extras and stuff, and they sit them down in front of uh, the stage, you know, in the first couple of rows. So maybe a, maybe six, seven, eight people. I, don't, I really don't remember. Maybe there's a, a dozen. And they take those first two rows. You perform to them. And uh, then there's also, like, the close-up segments, and those you mostly perform to the camera. Mm -hmm. So you... From those to the camera, the other segments, like the stage segments, you perform to the uh, the audience down on the floor. Uh, there's also like certain rules, like they pick who they want to be up on stage before, like so you don't even have a choice. They pick who you're using uh, because they want certain looks of people. Um, so it's it's very restrictive in that sense. Um, but yeah, like. If, if you're performing a stage piece, just perform it to the audience and there's like 10 cameras. So whatever they're looking for, they'll, they'll find the shot for you. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I would assume so by now they, they shoot these shows every year now, so they must have it kind of down to science. <laughs> yeah, they definitely must know what's going on. Um, this was another quick question. Uh, Ace Cunnings over on the old YouTubes wanted to know, do you have writers for your scripts and jokes or do you pretty much do all that yourself? Um, most of my routines start with some sort of joke or gag. Um, and then I work backwards from that joke or gag. Like I'll, I'll have a trick and then I'll, I'll put it away. And then when I find the right, 
like premise. I'm really into premises. So, um, you know, every, everything that I do has some sort of, or typically has some sort of premise to it. Uh, and then I work backwards from there, but, uh, I work, I've worked with a couple writers in the past. Uh, there's a, um, comedian who I work with on ships who, um, named Dan Gabriel and he writes some really terrific jokes. He's a funny dude. Uh, he, he's written a number of jokes for me and I always pay him, uh, for joke writing. I'll, I'll get a hold of him and go, Hey man, I'm working on this thing, you know, or this is the script I have. Uh, I want jokes here, here and here, and I need them to be about specific things, especially because like comedy magic's an interesting, uh, an interesting area for comedy in general. Um, because, I feel like the jokes should be about all the stuff that's happening at that moment, uh, as opposed to just telling a random joke. Um, if it doesn't either help the plot or, you know, move the, the routine forward, like it, it's just kind of telling a joke for joke's sake when you could be, you know, using the situation and pushing the plot forward and the jokes come organically out of the plot that, um, I think is, is most effective. And you can see this a lot of times with, uh, with like, uh, Matt King, Matt King's like the master of that, you know, every joke almost that he tells, um, has something to do with the action on stage. And I think that's the perfect way to do that. So, um, it's hard to write or work with a writer unless they've seen you or they know what's going on in your, uh, in your act, then like, you know, if you can get the the writer to come out and see your show, then they'll have an easier time helping you write because they'll know your voice. They'll know what the action is on stage and then can help you from there. Right on. Well said. Um, Talked a lot about cruise ship stuff, talked about some TV stuff. Um, You know, the big question that everyone wants to know is you are a professional magician you do a lot of different things to make your living, you know, these different things collectively. But for someone out there that is either new to magic, doesn't matter how old they are, and their goal and their mission is to become a professional magician, to quit the day job, to do this one day, what type of professional advice, you know, would you give people, you know, maybe what's worked for you, maybe some of these things that you would share to someone that wants to make a living as an entertainer, um, travel in the world like you do? Yeah, be, be persistent. Um, you know, reach out to the people who book stuff. I mean, you know, like a lot of guys sit at home waiting for the phone to ring, but they don't push towards, you know, making the contacts to make the avenue of performing they want to do uh, a reality. So, you know, and especially like right now um, is really hard because like nobody's working, right? Like nobody's even like you can't go to Like if you want to do restaurant shows or whatever, you can't really go out there and do that because like restaurants aren't even open. So, you know, that's, that's the hard part, but like, just be persistent about it, but also, you know, find something outside of magic that you're interested in so that you have other stuff to talk to people about, because, you know, this is a relationship business. Um, just like any sales position is, I mean, cause that's what we do. We're salesmen. We're not like magic is what we would do for free. And then, our business is selling magic shows. Um, so create relationships. And then, uh, you know, I've had, I've had some ideas about stuff to do during, uh, this whole thing. Like I want to get a flatbed trailer and put a stage on it and drag it around to like neighborhoods and like do social distance shows for like kids in neighborhoods. Cause like everybody's bored. That's like, cool. like, I don't even care about like making I want, like to do some, do some shows because that's what we love, right? And like not being able to do shows is brutal. You know, that's actually a little bit of a little poll thing I'm running on Facebook right now is uh, the uh, question for everyone is, have you done any virtual shows? Um, we've got a few people, actually more people so far have said no than yes. Looks like one person so far has said they have done a virtual show. Have you tiptoed or have you explored the possibility of doing a quote unquote virtual show or a online show for an audience. I know it's such a different medium, but is that something you thought about doing? Um, no. And I mean, well, look, we've all thought about it, sure. right? Like we've all considered the idea. 
Yeah. But I don't think anybody's cracked the code yet. Like there's something to be done here. And as soon as, and I was talking to Mark Halen about this and he said, uh, as soon as somebody figures it out, everyone will copy it Mm -hmm. because it'll be the exact right thing. Um, and, and there's something to be said about that. I think that if you have a different take on it than somebody else, then yeah, by all means, go ahead and give it a try because we only know by trying. Um, for me, that's like not really why I got into performing. I like performing for people. Um, and you could argue that, uh, a virtual show is for people, but like, it just seems so fake, like, and stilted, you know, you have to like pretend people are reacting or whatever, you know, I think that a better way of maybe doing this is like, and like, I don't know how you can charge people, um, to go on your live stream when like, you know, they're like, everybody who watches stuff on the internet is used to getting their content for free. Right. And so I think that maybe there's a way we can do live shows by, but still, you know, keeping with the social distancing thing and still keeping with, um, that's why I had an idea of like, you know, getting a flatbed trailer and driving it around to neighborhoods and, you know, maybe somebody in the neighborhood hosts the show so you can pull up in front of their house and then, you know, they, they put out flyers or whatever. Or they tell everyone, Hey, we're going to be doing this show and everyone sits on the lawn and you could do a, uh, um, a show for them. And then at least there's live people. Cause for me, like live entertainment, especially for magic is the best way of doing it. Yeah. I definitely love the idea of the, the truck, your little mini stage there going around. That's actually very, very smart. Uh, when you're not, you know, when you're not able to <clears throat> have people come to you, why not, why not go to the people? <laughs> and what's also cool about that is later you can use that same stage to take it to fairs and festivals and set it up at a festival. And like, you've got your own little stage now all the time, which is also really a cool thing to have. Super smart. So I think uh, it's definitely something that, you know, people are, are curious about this, this, you know, world of performing and, and being an entertainer. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I can't, I can't have my cake and eat it too. You know, Farrell has a family, he's got some kids, he's got, he's got that and he's able to go out on the road. So a lot of people think they can't do both, you know, um, but you have to manage it, I'm sure. And I can only speak from what I've seen, not from what yeah. I know, um, but it can be done. It can be done. Yeah. Well, also you have to have a, a spouse who, uh, is yeah. very understanding and, uh, loves our kids and takes care of the house while I'm gone and is uh, a far better person than I am. So, you know, I recognize that I'm a super lucky guy and, uh, you know, I try to take care of her as much as I can because that's like, you know, she's the reason that I'm able to do all the things that I'm able to do. Right on. Um, one of the last questions I was going to ask you here is, and I'm, I'm trying to pull it up, but I do know what it was. Um, you are one of the things you're the most known for, at least in my eyes, is the thimbles, the thimble act that you do. Um, a lot of people have been asking throughout this, how did you actually get started doing thimbles? What was it that made you pick those up and start making that your own? Um, I was getting on a plane somewhere and, uh, like the day before I was like, dude, I need something to fiddle with on the flight. So I had gone to the Chavez studio of magic, which is like a, um, they teach like classic sleight of hand. Um, and they have a thimble section. So I got my thimbles out and was like, look, I'm going to learn a thimble trick on the plane. Like I'm going to learn a sequence of thimble magic on the plane. And I was going like, maybe it maybe been like an eight hour flight. So I was like on this flight, I'm going to learn a thimble sequence that is cool. And I started, uh, doing that. And like, you know, I, uh, I was like, Oh, this is like a cool little thing. And then, you know, later on I was showing it to somebody and like kind of making fun of it because, um, thimbles are just a ridiculous item to do magic with. And that was part like, you know, so like while I was doing it, I was kind of making fun of it. And then 
you know, my friend, uh, it was Andrew Goldenhurst goes, why don't you just do it like that? That's pretty funny. And I was like, okay. And I just kind of started doing it that way. And, um, you know, he goes, you should do that. That's a good trick. And so I, I just kept doing it and then it kind of became my thing. And then I was like, oh, you know, I need to do this like again out of the straight jacket. That should, that would be funny. And then, uh, Tony Clark goes, you know, you should do it in the middle of the act too. So that people don't forget. So I was like, okay. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like a rule of three. So I kind of built a little holder and put it in my table. And, uh, that was that. And like, it became a thing, you know? And as soon as I did it the first time, I was like, oh man, this is like, you know, out of, like out of the straight jacket and stuff like that. I knew that I had something that was just <laughs> too funny. Oh yeah. You know, it was like, yeah, like action was just like, oh man, that was the biggest reaction I've ever gotten from anything. Wow. For thimbles. That's crazy. <laughs> Um, one, one quick extension of that, because this is something that I know you're very, uh, very much a pro at, uh, Radix says, how do you create your routine? So it's one thing to take tricks. I know we talked about writing jokes and scripting stuff, but when you put together a routine, um, what's your process and what would you recommend people think about when they're trying to do that? Uh, all right. So first, like, you know, we know all the moves, right? So like, like manipulation, especially like manipulative routines and multi-phase routines are a collection of moves um, that end up looking like effects, right? Yep. So um, just like play with the moves, put on some music, something like that, and just flow from thing to thing. And like, you know, it's all about playing, right? So you want to play for a little while. And then once you've played and you, you've gotten the routine, like you, you've kind of mapped out the routine in the way that you want to do it, um, then for me, like it's all about, then you go from, then you go to, uh, to scripting. So after that, like I go, okay, now I've got my routine. How do I want to script this together? Um, and then I sit down and write jokes that fit the actions. So everything has a little joke here and there. Like, but as I, as I, now that I have this routine, I then go back and I script the the jokes and stuff to fit the actions that I'm doing. Cool. Very good. Uh, and obviously, it's all, go ahead. it's all based on play. And that's exactly what I was going to say at the end of that was there's really only a way to do that. And that's to actually do it, to perform the stuff and see what flows and works well together. I mean, you can't, it might sound good up here, <laughs> but when you go to do it, it might not work. So, yeah. yeah. Everything is done in a vacuum until you do it for people. True that. Uh, I had to throw this your way. Ted Dan Ted Danger made a comment that I think you'll enjoy. He says, "Thimble magic, so exciting, but so like you're so." Yeah. Yeah, so. Yes, everybody cares about the fate of a thimble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Uh, I'm gonna grab our winners real quick as I let you get out of here, my friend. Um, we do have some giveaways. Like I tell you guys, every week we do live giveaways. So if you've never been with us before, get ready. I've got a couple of uh, at the table lectures of your choice to give away. You guys get any download that you want. Um, all you have to do is like and comment on this video on YouTube or Facebook. Our Facebook winner is Cody Ebert. Congrats to Cody. I'm gonna give him a little round of applause. There we go. Congrats to Cody. All right, all right. Uh, and our YouTube winner is dun, 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 Dave Rothberg. So congrats to Dave Rothberg. I uh, will get in touch with both of you guys. Actually, you should drop me a direct message on Facebook, Cody and Dave. I've seen you on both. So if you want to drop me a Facebook message there uh, on the Murphy's page, do that as well. Uh, we will get those out to you. And our winners from last week, the Danny Garcia chat, will be announced later today. We will tag the winners. So if you haven't seen those pop up yet, that's why I haven't announced them yet. All right. Farrell, any last words you want to sh uh, share with anybody uh, as we start to wrap this up, my friend? Everybody take care of yourselves and... We'll all get back to work pretty soon. Um, and you know what? While you have this time off, if you have this time off, please work on new stuff because you're going to be really happy that you did. Hey, Robert. Hi. All right. All right. We got our winners out there. Cool. Well, I'm going to – wait, wait. What's that? Is that, is that Harambe in the back? Is that – who's behind you? <laughs> is that like your Harambe? Perhaps. Anybody remember that guy? I oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> that was the thing. That was like the Tiger King of that. <laughs> oh, man. Good times. Well, thank you, Farrell, for hanging out. And thank you guys as well. If you haven't yet, make sure you say live in the comments. And the next time we do go live, you will get a notification and we will hook you up.
All right, my friends, you stay safe. And Farrell and I will give you our waves as we say goodbye. We will catch you next time. See you, everybody.